right, well, we're going to get started here. If everybody can uh, take their seats. And good morning. Beautiful, beautiful, snowy, peaceful morning, peaceful Sunday morning. We're going to sing a few very peaceful songs, actually, so it's kind of quite fitting to the, to the mood outside. Um, if you want to stand, we're going to sing our first one, number 361 in the red hymnal, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Next song we're going to do is Softly and Tenderly, number 246. 246 in the red hymnal, please.
Please be seated. I have a quick song for you to sing here. It's a song that really should not be any major revelation to us. It's called Be Jesus to Someone Today. It's something that the Lord always wanted us to be Christ-like. We can never be Christ, that's for sure, but we can always try to be Christ-like as much as we can each and every day of our lives. Thank you, Randy. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. We got a pretty, pretty full church here for a very snowy Sunday morning here in the Northwoods. Um, 
Again, thank you to Randy for leading the music. Thank you to Todd who came and uh, plowed us out here. And thank you to Kellen who's here with us uh, this Sunday and next Sunday, coming up from Antigo. Um, I'm going to read you something that Kellen sent me from Vince Lombardi. If you would drive through it to get to Lambeau, you probably should drive through it to get to church. <laughs> you probably never really said it, but it makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> That's all right. That was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. So glad you're all here. Uh, again, uh, this morning we're going to be having communion after Kellen's message and uh, the fellowship meal downstairs. Um, final update on the matching funds challenge. Again, thank you to all of you who participated. Uh, the total amount raised with the matching fund was $32,527. Praise the Lord. Yeah, that's, that's just a wonderful thing. So uh, great things are happening. Faith of All Ages is next Saturday on December 11th. Also December 11th, we're going to be having a work day at the new building. You want to say anything about that, Steve? I kind of could tell you were pacing back there. <laughs> I got one fan. All right. Uh, yeah, we're going to have a work day this coming Saturday. Uh, a lot of stuff that we're trying to get done. Um, guys who got tools, bring them. If you don't have any tools, uh, come anyways. There's grunt work to do. It's usually a lot of fun. Get out of the house and uh, do something productive. Uh, as far as the matching funds challenge, that money was part of it was we got to figure out what to do with the rest of it. But part of it was being raised to to do one of the bathrooms, get one of them functional. Uh, Todd was out there this weekend getting some of the plumbing going. So we've got plumbing going, we've got HVAC going, we've got some of electrical going. So a lot of different fronts that we're making progress on. Um, so come out next Saturday and, uh, you know, we'll try not to work you too hard. Thank you for reminding me. The propane tanks have been filled. Uh, so as soon as we get power onto those furnaces, we can fire them up. Um, so that's part of what we're going to be working on on Saturday. Anything else, Ron? Jack? What time? As early as you can get there. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, not before Ron. Ron, when are you getting there? Friday night. Okay. Friday night. We're going to start at Friday night. See, see, Mark, Jack is talking about bringing micrometers. I just use a tape measure. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, tape measure, hammer, uh, impact driver, or drill gun if you've got one. Um, the guys, a couple of you guys have brought your miter saws in the past. If you could bring them again, that'd be great. Um, if you don't have them, don't worry about it. Um, but otherwise, just, just basic tools like that should be fine. Anybody else? Nope? Okay. We'll start about 8 o'clock, all right, and go to whenever, and uh, we'll have some. Yeah, give them time, Steve. They want a time, 8 o'clock. Um, and then um, if some of you can't make it for the morning, make it for the afternoon, make it for the afternoon. Uh, we'll have uh, lunch available as well, too. Diane and Jeannie will be making some sandwiches for you all, and we'll have water, and so does Eric, and as, as always, okay? So great. Thank you for that. I'll be putting out a... Uh, a one call now on that, and we kind of want to get an idea of who's going to be there, so let Steve or myself know. Well, probably let me know, and I'll let Steve know, um, since I'm a little bit more reachable, and uh, um, plus we're also making the food. All right, great. Christmas caroling on, Saturday, on Sunday, the 19th. Okay, Amanda's in charge of that. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, anything about that you want to say? All right. Bring what? Bells. bells. That's what I thought she said. All right, so bring lunch and bells. All right, sounds great. All right, great. Any other announcements that we have? Yes, Kate.
All right, thank you, Kate. Very good. Any other announcements? Yes, Jeannie. All right, if you didn't bring food, come and join us. We can have seconds, right? All right. Good. Any other announcements? All right, hearing none. Um, any prayer requests, needs, praises that we have this morning that we want to offer up? Yes, Josh. Okay. Yep. So obviously he passed away young, so. Yes, Randy. Got it. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else? Oh, hi. There you are. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Yeah, Jack. Yep. Yeah, Jesse. Okay. And she's young, right? Good. Anything else? Yeah, Diane. Good. Amanda. Oh, yeah, little buddy. What's up? Your great grandfather died? Okay. All right. Still hurts. Yeah. What's his name? Little boy. Peter? Okay. Okay. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, it's, it's, it's great to gather here this morning. You know, in some ways, even having to travel here through, uh, what, about six inches of snow, I guess, we've had this morning, and Kellen coming all the way from Antigo, and just us coming from our homes, it took an effort to get here, and, uh, and we're glad that we're here, because you are worth the effort. And Father, you, in our lives, you are constantly in action. You're constantly working within our lives. 
even giving us miracles that we don't even know are happening or that have happened. How you provided for us, protect us, keep us from harm. And Father, I pray over this body of believers right now, Lord. I ask your divine protection over each and every one, their families, their households. Has your protection around them from the enemy, Lord. And from this church as well, too, Lord God, as we spoke about earlier in our, in our uh, announcements, as we're looking forward to the day when we'll be in the new building that you, will be, that you provided for us, to use that in a way that will magnify and glorify you and our Lord Jesus Christ in amongst this neighborhood, in this community, in this area. We pray that as Randy sung his song, be Jesus to someone today. Father, keep us in, in mind through the Holy Spirit of those divine opportunities, those divine appointments, those times when we can share the love of Jesus with somebody, share the light with somebody, and share the truth with somebody. I think, Father, of, of those in our families, in our neighborhood, in our friendship circle, our work circle, of those who do not know you as Lord and Savior. Each, each of us has someone in mind. And Father, I just want to take a second or minute here and just quietly would ask that we all lift up to the Lord right now the name of one or two people who are in your lives who need the Lord Jesus in our life. We want to lift their names up to you right now, Lord. We pray that in some way, in your way, whether it's through a, another fellow believer, whether, whether it's through a tract, whether it's through a Bible, whether it's through something on the radio or the television that they are passing through, channel surfing, all of a sudden come across something, Father, that is, that is orientated toward sharing the truth of Jesus Christ. That, Father, that these people who we lifted up to you right now this morning, we become part of your family through Christ. Father, this world is a world of, of toil. This world is a world of, of, of suffering and of hardship. We thank you for you who helps us through these things, who gives us that peace, that surpasses understanding. Father, we lift up to you right now uh, the student of Josh's who's, uh, who lost her father. So Father, we pray for that family, lift them up. Randy's niece, Jill, who is suffering with Crohn's disease. Kate's grandson and his wife, who with the loss of their baby. Mike's lung cancer and skin cancer. Young Brooklyn suffering mightily with the cancer that's ravaging her body right now. And we lift all these people up to you, Lord. We lift all these families up to you, Lord. For your miraculous touch, in the name of Jesus. Again, for your peace through the midst of this difficult times. And even for those who do not know you as Savior within these situations, Lord, that this would be used to bring the ones we just prayed for or those around them to a knowledge of Christ in their lives. We think of uh, Peter's great-grandpa. You know, he's passed away a while, away, but a while ago, but that loss is still there. So for little Peter, I pray for, again, your peace upon his heart as well, too. As Diane said, we thank you for Eric, uh, who's back home after being injured in that uh, Waukesha parade situation. Long road in front of him, the father. We thank you for the healing that's going on in his body right now, and I pray for that family. I pray that this family would come to know you as Lord and Savior through this as well, too. Now, Lord, I lift up Kellen to you. Pray, Father, that uh, the Holy Spirit be working through 
what he would share with us this morning. His words would be your words, his thoughts, your thoughts. Put a hedge around his, his time of speaking to us this morning to keep the enemy from throwing anything that would not be of profit or value. And again, we thank you just for his dedication and his willingness to be here this morning. It's all for your glory. We pray all these things in Christ Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior. Amen. All right. Good morning, everybody. If my uh, children misbehave, just treat them like your own. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's good to be here, and uh, I've got one question for you before I get rolling. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about some people, and I could either talk about, about them as forerunners or appetizers. Which way do we want to go today, forerunners <laughs> or appetizers? Uh, no preference one way or the other? Uh, I guess we don't eat people, so we'll go with forerunners. So. Yeah, we don't eat people, but it's that Christmas time of year, you know. Um, so, yeah, we'll go with uh, forerunners. Today we'll look at uh, Jesus in the book of Genesis. And so we'll see six forerunners and one that isn't a forerunner of Jesus. Uh, so we're going to be looking at Jesus in the book of Genesis. And as I've been thinking about this, uh, there are a few things that didn't quite make the cut. So we're not going to talk about Jesus as the creator we're not going to talk about Jesus as a second Adam. We're not going to talk about Jesus as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But we're going to look at uh, starting off with Adam and Eve, with the very first couple in the Garden of Eden. Uh, these are the first two humans that God has made. And if you have your Bible, turn over to Genesis 3. Uh, in Genesis 2, God had given the man a specific restriction to not eat of a certain tree. And then God gives him the woman. Adam had communicated to her uh, also to not eat of this particular tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in Genesis 3, uh, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And right here, the serpent is conniving and uh, deceiving and tricking her, and she's moved from the freedom that they have uh, to, they could actually touch this fruit. They just weren't to eat of it. And she's made God more restrictive. She's um, shortened the... Uh, severity of the consequences of the sin as well. Uh, God had warned them that they would surely die, and she just says, lest you die. Uh, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. This is uh, a very direct lie. Uh, God had promised they will surely die, and he says, you will not surely die. So it's gone from you will surely die, lest you die, you will not surely die. The deception is uh, taking root here. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig, fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me. She gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And I want us to focus on these next two verses here. Uh, it's really going to set up everything that we'll look at today. The Lord God said to the serpent. So this blame game has passed the baton of who's at fault from Adam to Eve to the serpent. And now God addresses them in reverse order. And 
verse 14 and 15 is vital. Uh, this is the first promise that we have. We've gone from everything being very good, people being very good, basically a perfect world to a fallen world, a world that's been marked by sin, a world that has had death introduced to it. And the first thing that God says is to this serpent, and this is the first promise of even though things are bad, there will be something different. This is the first hint of the gospel message. And God, I love this, preaches it to the serpent. He preaches the gospel to the devil himself. Uh, this is good news for everybody besides the one that, Jesus, that is being talked to right here. So Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Verse 15 is key. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And that verse, verse 15, is called the Proto-Evangelium by people that like to use big words. It's the first gospel. It's the first hint of what Jesus would do. And there's some really interesting things in the, the wording of this. I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring. That word is literally seed. Between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So Eve and Adam are eavesdropping on this conversation as God is promising the blow to the head of the serpent. And what do you think they do with it? What sort of timing do they have? And I want to ask you a question. With the difficulties that you face in life, with your own sin even, with the things that you've done wrong, how soon do you want things to be made right? Well, Eve is expecting something to come from her, a seed to issue from her that's going to make everything right. And in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, we see how she is thinking about this and processing this. And uh, her timing is just like ours. We want God to make everything right right now. So in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, we see forerunner, question mark, number 1. Uh, in Genesis chapter 4, 1, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Here he is. We've, I've got a man. Finally, we've got him. Uh, interestingly, in verse 2, it doesn't mention some of the things mentioned in verse 1. It doesn't mention Adam knowing his wife again. It doesn't mention conceiving again. It just says, and again, she bore his brother Abel. Uh, so we've got one conception, two boys. So they're most likely twins, uh, Cain and Abel. Uh, the first, she celebrates. She's looking for God to deliver on this promise to crush the head of that serpent. And she's so excited when she's got the first boy. And the second one doesn't really matter because she's going to get salvation right then, right there through Cain in her own expectation. She's gotten this man that's going to crush the head of the serpent. Well, that's what her hope was. In reality, as you go through chapter 4, what you'll see is that these two boys end up kind of being rivals. And one loves the Lord with a pure heart, and one doesn't. And Cain is the one that doesn't. He's kind of jealous of Abel. And he uh, comes to this point where they offer sacrifices before God, and God accepts Abel and his sacrifice, and God rejects Cain and his. And God warns Cain to have some self-control, and Cain refuses, and he gets furious, and he murders Abel, his twin brother. The end result of all of this is uh, that this boy that Eve had hoped in is a total disappointment. He's not even in the line of Noah or you or me. Uh, his entire line ends up being wicked people that are all wiped out in the flood of Noah. But God is gracious. And so even though Cain ends up not being the one uh, God is still gracious. And, and we need to step back and look at our own lives, too. Uh, when we face difficulties, there is someone who is the solution to our sins, and that is Jesus. Uh, but sometimes we try to work it out on our own way. Now, you've all been taught good gospel uh, teaching for many, many years here, right? Uh, so you're not going to come out and say, oh, I'm trying to earn a right standing with God or anything like that. You're not trying to earn your salvation. But 
functionally day to day when you screw up? Don't you try to go and make it right? Don't you try to find your own solution? Eve was looking for salvation in the wrong place. She was looking for it in Cain, and he wasn't even in the right category. He was a bigger problem, and he was a murderer, and it ended up totally backfiring. But here's God's mercy. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 25 and 26, we see an actual forerunner, and this is forerunner number one. Verse 25 and 26 says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. And the word Seth means appointed. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of, notice here, it went from Cain is the important one, Abel's inconsequential. She says here, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So here's our first forerunner, and this is Seth. And Eve is recognizing that this one has been appointed for something, something that Cain couldn't do, something that Abel, by being dead, he can't do. It must be through this one that God is going to deliver on the promise. And there's two sides to that. On the one hand, Seth isn't the one that's going to deal the crushing blow to the head of the serpent. But on the other hand, it is through Seth, it's through him and through his line that we're going to get Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and David and Jesus. It's going to be through this boy. So he was appointed. Uh, so Eve at least has gone from looking for salvation in the wrong place to just having the wrong timing on it. How many of us want God to make everything right right now? Uh, I talk to people that uh, are angry at God. Some are atheists, and there's atheists that have like really intellectual reasons for not believing in God. And then there's the more common atheists that I run into that are angry at God. And so I'm going to not believe in him because I'm angry at him because something bad happened. This is called the problem of evil. And if you stop and think about it, what is it that we're expecting of God? We're expecting God and if we're in that sort of a mindset, we're expecting God to make everything perfect right now. And what would be involved with God making everything perfect right now? Getting rid of everything imperfect. Who's imperfect? Right? So when you have struggles with the problem of evil, with things that are going wrong, uh, you're angry at God because he's not getting rid of all the imperfect things, including us, including people that haven't heard the gospel yet. Uh, so when I talk to atheists who are angry at God because of bad things that have happened, I remind them that if God were to make everything perfect right now, it would involve killing everybody uh, that's imperfect, and it would include killing them, and God is being merciful and giving them an opportunity to repent, and God does want to make everything perfect, and he will make all things new in the end. So at least with Seth, she's looking for salvation in the right place. It would come through Seth, but not directly from him, and it's just her timing is off. Sometimes we want God to make everything right right now, and that timing isn't quite right. Well, Chapter 5, we go through Seth's line all the way down to some interesting people like Methuselah who lived uh, the longest life ever, and actually his life ended the same year of the flood. Uh, we get Lamech, another guy who uh, ends up being the father of Noah and uh, being warned that in his day the world would be divided. We've got uh, these interesting people, but we get to the next forerunner, and that forerunner is Noah. And I just want to look at Genesis 6, verses 8 through 9, and see how God talks about Noah. This is forerunner number 2. Uh, in verse 8, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so this word for favor, it's grace. God has a gracious outlook on Noah. The world is filled with wicked people at this point in time. God is furious and he's ready to wipe out all of humanity, but he finds one man that he has a gracious outlook on, and that man is Noah. In verses 9 and 10, it says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. 
So this is another thing about Noah. He does find grace in God's eyes. He had some sin where God had to show favor to him, but he was a righteous man compared to all the other people in the world. He was perhaps the most righteous man alive. It, he is described as being blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. So his conduct is right, his spirituality is right, he's in a relationship with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Hem, and Japheth. So these, uh, this man Noah sticks out for his righteousness. Noah is another forerunner of Jesus. He found favor in God's eyes, he's righteous, he's blameless, he walked with God. And uh, this is the next one that we're looking to, is, is he the one? Is he the one that's going to crush the head of the serpent? Uh, in some ways, yeah. I was the guy that builds the boat that rescues the only righteous people on the planet. Uh, everybody else ends up being wiped out. This is a blow to those that are opposed to God. But it ultimately crush the head of the serpent. And so we keep looking for the next one. And by the way, Noah isn't perfect. Noah, when we get to uh, coming off of the ark, he gets drunk and some bad things happen. And uh, So Noah is a sinner like the rest of us, but he received God's grace, and compared to the other people, he was righteous and he was blameless. But it foreshadows one who would be blameless, who would be truly righteous, who would have no sin whatsoever, and that one, of course, is Jesus. All right, so it's not Seth, it's certainly not Cain, it's not Noah. So what about the next one? Uh, Genesis chapter 12, we encounter another very important person. In Genesis chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, this is our new guy, Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And look at this promise that God makes to this one man. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Wow, this guy is going to be a blessing to the whole world. And through him, God is going to bless absolutely everybody on the entire planet. That is amazing. But then you look at his life, and this guy is a coward, and he lies, and he sets his wife up for some really awkward situations with some kings. And uh, Abraham uh, is a really important guy. Uh, it's through his line that the whole world would be blessed, but he himself wasn't such a big blessing to everybody that he encountered. So God's plan to bless the whole world would go through Abraham and his descendants, but Abraham himself wouldn't quite be the guy. Well, what about Abraham's son? He's got actually two of them, one that uh, is a product of his adultery, his lack of faith in God. His name is Ishmael, but the true son, the son of promise, is named Isaac. And in Genesis 22, we get one of the most compelling uh, accounts in all of the Bible that gives us a foretaste of what it would be like to be God. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 8, uh, we ha see this testing of Abraham. And this is a test that I would never, ever, ever want to have to go through. Uh, and my son, firstborn Carson, definitely would not want to go through this one, right? Uh, but Genesis 22, 1 through 8. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, said to him, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Just imagine this. You've got, first of all, a relationship with God where he speaks to you directly, but then the, the way he is calling for him to uh, offer the sacrifice, your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Remember what Jesus said, wh or what God the Father said when Jesus was being baptized? He said, this is my son, my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Uh, and again, on uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, he describes his son in a similar way. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Uh, here is Abraham's son, his only true son, his only son of the promise. Uh, and this is one that he loves, his beloved son. Well, what would you do? I mean, if you 
decide to kill your son, that's generally not a good thing, but God's calling you to do it. So now you're in this place of your son that you've had this promise about for many years, you've hoped for, and miraculously he comes. Uh, You love him a lot, but you have to love God above everything else, right? Otherwise, it's idolatry. So, man, God, this is a difficult test that you're putting before him. In verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship. Notice this next line. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. All right, so Abraham, on the one hand, is fully expecting to go and kill his son. On the other hand, he's fully expecting to come back with his son. And both of them are going to come back to these servants. Abraham, uh, according to the book of Hebrews, believes that even if he kills his son Isaac, because God has promised that he will do something through Isaac, if he kills his son Isaac, God will raise him from the dead. Do you know where this is happening? This is on a mountain near Moriah. Do you know where Mount Moriah is? It's in Jerusalem. Uh, There's pretty good chance that this is happening on the mountain outside of Jerusalem where Jesus himself would later be crucified. Well, Abraham is going with his son, ready to kill his son, and yet believing that both he and his son will come back. In verse 6, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. Imagine this, Isaac's carrying the wood that's going to be used to burn him. And Abraham's got the stake ready uh, to kill a sacrifice, and he's got this torch in the other hand. And Isaac is a pretty smart little boy here in verse 7. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And look what Abraham says here. His faith is so amazing. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both went, so they went both of them together. Abraham believes that God will provide a lamb. He's uh, to the point where he's like, I'm willing to kill my son Isaac, but I believe that God's going to provide a lamb instead. Well, as this continues to carry out, verse 9, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Uh, If you're Isaac, you're like, hey, what about that lamb? This would be a really good time. Uh, Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Uh, He is ready to plunge this thing into him. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram. Notice Abraham said that God would provide a lamb, a little one. Uh, And he looked behind him and he saw a ram. So Abraham was looking for one thing, and God didn't provide that yet right here. Uh, It's a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place. Notice he doesn't say the Lord has provided, the Lord is providing. He says the Lord will provide. Abraham was still looking for another sacrifice. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Probably on that same mount, Perhaps at that exact same spot, God's smart and knows all of history, uh, there would come a man about 2,000 years after this, and it would be God's own beloved son that would be right there. And when it comes time for him to be pierced, God doesn't say no. God doesn't say there will be another one. God says, let it be. And his son was the sacrifice for our sins on Mount near Moriah in Jerusalem. All right, so Isaac is definitely a forerunner, a definite foreshadow of Jesus, but he isn't the one that would be the sacrifice. 
Another forerunner is Isaac's son, Jacob. Uh, and remember what God told Eve? He said, or what God told the serpent in front of Adam and Eve? He says, you shall bruise his heel. Uh, this word heel is akov. Uh, and Jacob's name is Yaakov. It's built off of the word heel. It's got something to do with heel. It means something like heel grabber. In fact, we've got another set of twins here that's born, uh, Jacob and his brother Esau. And as they're coming out, Jacob is holding on to the heel of his brother Esau. Even though Esau was born first, Jacob's like, no, I want to be first. And he's grabbing at the heel here. So uh, when you see this promise of something about crushing a heel, Jacob is the name that would come to mind if you're reading it in Hebrew. Akov Yaakov, all right? So Genesis 25, verse 26. Now we get this little introduction to Jacob. Uh, it says, Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Uh, so this heel grabber is introduced to us. And Isaac was 60 years old when she bore him. Uh, it's just an interesting play there. The uh, other thing that's interesting about Jacob and the serpent is the serpent is described as being craftier than any of the beasts of the field. And Jacob is this crafty, schemer sort of a guy. He's kind of another, you know, there, there are multiple foreshadowings of Jacob with the serpent. Uh, and so Jacob is this trickster, and he keeps trying to do different tricks uh, throughout the account here, and he has to trick his dad, uh, and he has to trick his brother, and between his scheming and conniving and trickstering, this heel grabber ends up supplanting his brother Esau, who was born before him, and he gets his birthright, he gets his blessing, he takes the place of the firstborn, even though he isn't, and all of that evil, trickster, dishonest, deceitful sort of stuff, nonetheless ends up with Jacob instead of Esau being the one through whom the Messiah would come. So Jacob ends up in the line. Uh, he is the heel boy, if you will, but he's not the one that would crush the head of the serpent. We get one other forerunner, and I've never heard anybody preach on this. Uh, so this will hopefully at least be worth your time coming out in the snow if nothing else was. And, uh, it's in Genesis chapter 43. Um, after Jacob, the book of Genesis, Genesis spends a lot of time on Jacob's 12 boys. And it focuses on one. One of the boys looks a whole lot like Jesus. If you had to pick one, there's one boy that it, we hear nothing bad about. All the other uh, brothers have things that they do that are sinful uh, but you've got one that sticks out, and it's Joseph. You'd say, hey, if I had to pick one of these to be the one that the Messiah is coming through, I would pick Joseph. Anybody would have. Joseph's the most virtuous. He's handsome. He's hardworking. He's a great leader. He's got wisdom. He's got skills. Uh, Joseph is the guy that makes all the sense in the world, but it's not Joseph that God chooses. Instead, it's his brother Judah. And as I was reading through this in family devotions with my kids in uh, Genesis chapter 43, we get this little interaction with Judah. And by the way, Judah's not a great guy. Judah uh, had four boys, and uh, two of them died, and then the third one was uh, married to this lady, and then he dies, and then instead of having that boy, instead of giving her to his last remaining son, uh, he deprives her of the right to produce an heir for him. Uh, this is the one through whom uh, ultimately Jesus is going to come, is through Judah. And yet he is not allowing his uh, daughter-in-law to produce an heir. And so she's living as this single widow with him, and lots of immoral things end up happening. And Judah is at the heart of all sorts of wickedness, right? Uh, so Judah has blown it pretty badly but we get to this point where Joseph is in Egypt. He's become the second most powerful man in the world behind Pharaoh himself. And Joseph has stockpiled food, and a famine has come to the land, and he's done some trickstery things with his brothers. Uh, they don't know that they're dealing with their brother that they've betrayed. And uh, they have gone to Egypt, come back, and now they've got to go back again. And as they have to go back to Egypt to get some food, there's a favorite son. The favorite son is Benjamin, and their father, Jacob, uh, 
doesn't want Benjamin to go down to Egypt. And Joseph down in Egypt wants to see Benjamin. And they're in this awkward situation. They're out of food. The family is starving. If they don't get food, they're going to die. Uh, there's no place to go. And Judah recognizes the severity of the issue. Jacob loves Benjamin so much, he's weighing out, is it worth it just to die? At least I'll get to see Benjamin. And Judah is thinking, mm, all right. So here's how they handle this conversation. Genesis 43. Now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, go again, buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, the man, this is referring to Joseph, solemnly warned us, saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send your brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel, this is Jacob's new name that God gave to him. Israel said, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we, what we could tell him was in answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, bring your brother down? Look at what Judah says here. And Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the boy with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die. So he sees this must happen, and it's for the sake of life. It's so that this family that God is going to bless the whole world through doesn't die, but that instead this family can live. In verse 9, I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would now have returned twice. Did you see that? Judah has something within him where he says, this family must live. This family must not die. And because of that, I'm willing to put myself in the place where I will bear the guilt of this. If he dies, I die. I'm willing to be a substitute so that they can have life. That is the character of the one that would become the tribe that Jesus would come from. Judah is a foreshadow of one, not like Isaac, who's put in a place of being the sacrifice, uh, kind of against his will, but Judah's one willing to say, if it comes down to it, I'm willing to be the sacrifice so that this family can stay alive. He's the one that is a foreshadow of Judas, or, or <laughs> Jesus, whoa, don't mix Judah and G Jesus wrongly there. All right, so yeah, he's the foreshadow of Jesus. So the bottom line is that while nobody in Genesis would crush the head of the serpent, many of them point compellingly forward to the one who would, namely Jesus Christ. As promised to Eve, Jesus would be the seed of a woman, born of a virgin. Unlike Cain or Seth, Jesus would come at the right time. Unlike Noah, Jesus would be 100% truly righteous and sinless. Fulfilling the promise to Abraham, Jesus would bless all the families of the earth. As promised to Isaac, Jesus would be the lamb that God would provide on the mountain of the Lord. As hinted at by that healer, heel grabber Jacob, Jesus would take the bruise on his heel. It ultimately would kill him. But he would rise on the third day, and his resurrection would deliver a blow to the head of the serpent who will spend eternity in the lake of fire. Like Judah, Jesus would look at the impending death of his brothers. He would look at those that his father loves, and he would say, like Judah, my life for theirs. There is one more promise in Genesis. Uh, as Jacob is on his deathbed, he blames each of his, or blesses each of his boys. When he gets to Judah, he makes this promise in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. It says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Judah would ultimately be the one that would have the kingly line. It would be from Judah that you get David and ultimately that we get Jesus. So there will be a time coming that will fulfill this promise that the whole world will come to be obedient to Jesus. And that's what we do when we're making disciples of all nations. We're preparing people to obey the king that would come through the line of Judah. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this season that some call Advent is a time uh, to think back on the first time that Jesus came to be with us and to look forward to the second time that Jesus will come again. And we long for him to be here. We long for him to make all things new. We long for all that is wrong to be set right. And we as Christians are setting our hope completely on that grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We long for the promises to be completely fulfilled of Jesus reigning as the one with the scepter from Judah, as Jesus crushing the head of the serpent. And we we're longing for it. We're looking forward to it. And I pray that this season would be a time where we grow in our hope. Uh, I pray that we would also be patient and that we'd be busy about the work you've given us. We don't want Jesus to come back and make everything perfect and result in people that we love going to hell. So help us to be diligent about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ until he returns. We pray it in his name. Amen. Go into our uh, time of worshiping at the Lord's table. And so did everybody pick up your your communion? So up there, Randy, if you want to maybe pass those out to him and raise their hand and give those out. And here at Lake Tomahawk Bible Church, we believe in open communion. Uh, there's no age requirement. Uh, the only requirement is that you've accepted Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And uh, uh, you are more than... More than happy to have you join us as we have our communion together. As Randy's doing that, I just want to talk about a couple of things. Um, the word atonement, meaning, and that's the central theme throughout the whole Bible, that's the reconcil reconciliation of God to mankind through Jesus Christ. All right? And uh, um, from Genesis to the book of Revelation, we read about and we hear about the atonement of Christ that's going to be happening at the birth, after the birth of Christ, 33 years there, on the, Mount, on, the, on, the, on the Mount of Calvary there. And so when I was thinking about this, and I want to be real long here because I know we're all hungry, is that there are times in our lives as Christians, at least myself personally, especially as an earlier Christian, where I sometimes had... Um, misgivings or I needed assurance was I saved am I saved you know is this belief in Jesus Christ is it enough is he the one can, can I believe in him and this is all gonna be taken care of you know and I think that's normal I, I don't I don't think that's something that's that's wrong I think many of us go through that at a point in time as well as we're kind of working out our salvation as the apostle speaks about to us in scripture you know that's all part of the process if you will and I know it was for me as well too and then when we really got that set up in our, in our heart and our mind and our soul that this is, you know, that he is, you know, that enables ourselves to really just really hang tight and really live for Jesus in a much more complete and fuller way, I think. You know, because we are convinced, right? Paul talked about, I am truly convinced. We are truly convinced. Jude speaks about that, too, that we are convinced, all right? And... Um, and Jesus is all that Kellen you spoke about this morning. He is all of who the Bible talks to us about. I want to go through just a few verses here as we, we prepare our hearts for the time with the Lord. And most of them may be in the book of Hebrews, believe it or not. Uh, Hebrews 7, 26 and 27 says, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, we're talking about Jesus here, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because he did once for all when he offered up himself. Once. Once for all. It was enough. Hebrews 9, 24 through 28 reads, for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as a high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. 
Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And in so much as it appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. And we eagerly await him, do we not? And when we do a communion, we, 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 we uh, celebrate communion together. Again, as I said in the past, it's our remembrance, right? Remembrance what he has done for us at the cross of Calvary, his death, his sacrifice for our sins, the blood shed for our sins, and that through him we are righteous before God. That's the atonement that we have received. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, By this we, will have, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's all it takes. That's what, that's what it is. It's not things that we do. It's not things that we say. It's not what we can give. It's not our deeds. It's only through Christ. But verse 12 says, But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. That's where he is. He's waiting for us to be there. We will be there one day, right? You know, when we leave this, this earth, uh, absence from the body is presence with the Lord, amen. We'll be there. And for by one offering, in verse 14, he has perfected for all times those who are sanctified. We are sanctified. You are sanctified. All right, for all times. For all times. Sometimes we... I, in the past, will sit there and wonder, man, and when I sin, because I still sin today, unfortunately, I'll say to man, Timling, man, you know? And then sometimes, any moment I throw a fiery dart of doubt into my mind. But yet, we can rest upon the scriptures, rest upon what Jesus Christ did, and we have assurance of our salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. A couple more verses, then we'll go into our celebration of the Lord's Supper here. Um, 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. All right. Scripture is just, again, talking more and more and more about what Christ has done for us. And we, that, what we believe in. I want to end with 1 John 5, 11 through 13. You guys probably know this one. And the testimony is this, says John the Apostle, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I've written to you so that you may, would believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have eternal life. Yeah. Know that. Rest in that. Even when the enemy throws fiery darts against us and has us doubting things, all right, rest assured. Scripture has just showed us here this morning and from what Kellen also spoke to us this morning as well, too, that this is true. Let's celebrate the Lord's table together, shall we? So if you want to grab up your, uh, your cup and wafer, we'll take all these together. So we'll lift up the top seal to get that wafer. All right. That the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. We had given thanks. He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Prepare the cup. There will be a time when we'll go back to the old way. It's just not yet. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Randy, if you'd please come up and end us with a song. And then I'll come up and we'll just uh, bless the meal that we'll be having downstairs. Thank you, Randy. We're going to sing hymn number 100, O Come All Ye Faithful, in honor of our Advent season here. I just want to say thank you, Colin, for sharing the word of the Lord with us. And I always like the story of Adam and Eve. It kind of takes me back to my childhood sometimes where we were going on a family trip and everybody's in the car and my dad's wondering, what is she doing in there, my mother, in the house? And I think back, well, man has been waiting for woman since the dawn of time. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right, number 100, oh come all ye faithful, this is what we're going to do. Dear Heavenly Father, we do adore you. We adore our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of grace you've given us through Christ on the cross on Calvary. Thank you for our salvation that's afforded us through the blood of Christ. It is all because of you. It is all from you. And Father, we love you. And Jesus, we love you. And Holy Spirit, we love you. And now as we Prepare to uh, uh, join together downstairs for a fellowship time and a time of meal and, and, and good, good discussions, Lord God. Pray your blessing upon the meal. Thank you for the foods prepared at, Lord God. And as we leave this place to go home, I pray for travel's mercy for each and every person to bring them home safe. We thank you. We love you. And as your children, we all say to you, amen. <laughs>